from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. In the words of famous people like Nobel laureate Niels Bohr and baseball legend Yogi Berra, predictions are very difficult, especially if they're about the future. Hello and welcome to this week's the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. In this special breaking analysis, we're pleased to host our third annual data predictions power panel with some of our collaborators in the Cube Collective and members of the Data Gang. With us today are five of the top industry analysts focused on data platforms, Sanjeev Mohan of Sanjmo, Tony Baer of DB Insight, IDC's Carl Olofsson, Dave Menninger, who is with Ventana Research, now part of ISG, and Doug Henschen with Constellation Research. Guys, thanks, we really appreciate you, and we are very excited for our annual look ahead on data. Now, before we get into it, I want to briefly share some ETR data from an October survey of more than 1,700 IT decision makers. This graphic shows net score, or spending momentum on the vertical axis, and the overlap of these platforms within those 1,700 accounts representing the pervasiveness of the platform within the data set. And this is data isolated for the analytics, business intelligence, database data warehouse, and ML AI sectors. And we've selected a subset of the companies in this group of, of se sectors that are representative vendors of today's discussion. Notice that red line at 40%. Anything above that is, indicates a highly elevated velo spending velocity on a platform. So a couple of quick points and then we'll get into it. First of all, the presence of Microsoft and AWS is, is impressive and notable, well ahead of Google Cloud. The momentum of OpenAI at a net score of nearly 80% is astoundingly high. And its presence on the x-axis represents about seven times the account penetration of Anthropic, which you see in the left-hand side of the chart just above Data IQ. Snowflake and Databricks remain above the 40% mark with pretty strong momentum. And you can see a number of other companies that we'll discuss directly or indirectly across this graphic in this basket of sectors that we've chosen. MongoDB, SAP, IBM, Watson. And then we've got governance, metadata, pipeline, and ETL tools like Informatica, Calibra, Alation, Altrix, et cetera. You got BI platforms like ThoughtSpot, Click, Tableau, and Looker. And of course, a number of database and data analytic platforms like Couchbase, Cloudera, SaaS, and of course, Oracle. So this gives you a general quantitative sense of the relative position of these platforms and what is a multi-hundred billion dollar TAM. Okay, let's get started by looking back at this team's 2023 predictions and looking at how the analysts fared. This graphic just shows all of the 2023 predictions for each analyst in one table. It's got a little commentary on evidence of whether the prediction was a direct hit, which is green, a glancing blow, which is yellow, or a miss, which is the red. So a quick scan of the heat map shows that the data gang did pretty well in its 2023 predictions. Notwithstanding that these were self-evaluated by each of our <laughs> analysts. Okay, so let's get into the 2023 predictions review, starting with Sanjeev Mohan. We're showing Sanjeev your prediction about unified metadata becoming the kingmaker and your expectation that the that data products would rise in popularity. And you're sharing evidence of Microsoft Fabric, Databricks Uni Unity Catalog, and some other proof points. Take it away and explain your logic and your assessment. Yeah, so we uh, when we came up with these predictions last year, this is before AI took off, uh, my whole uh, uh, thesis was that data catalogs are going to become more powerful, they'll add more use cases uh, and go far beyond just being catalogs. And at that time I was thinking uh, data quality, security, privacy, some of those things, and then Unity Catalog came up and we see it has merged the AI model catalog along with the data catalog. Microsoft Fabric, uh, I thought, is, is a really uh, great concept that brings together different disparate pieces of the architecture of the stack into one place. So, so this is how I see metadata is starting to converge for different use cases. <clears throat> The second uh, prediction I had was on data products. I was so upbeat about data products that I ended up writing a book called Data Products for Dummies on that. I feel data products have now become mainstream. I have multiple conversations every week where people are now starting to create these data products. For example, 
I was at KubeCon conference uh, a couple of months ago. I met with the Intuit team. They have 900 data products. And I was told that the mandate for them is that in the future, all access to data is going to be through a data product. So I feel data products have become a common theme. In fact, the definition, the examples of data products have also increased. Last year at this time, I, like I said, AI was not in the picture, but now that we are so deep into the space, so things like RAG pipelines, for instance, uh, I'll be talking about agents, AI agents, a lot of these are actually data products. So you could do your LLM inference and have a whole mechanism and wrap it up into a data product. So I, that's why I rate both of these as green. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, next we got to Tony Bear. We're going to be rapid fire here. Tony, you predicted that the industry would begin to rethink the modern data stack and you've cited some evidence of that with a mix of green, yellow, and red. So appreciate the self-evaluation. Explain your 2023 prediction in more detail and your assessment of its accuracy, please. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, well, number one, uh, the modern data stack was a whole idea to basically sort of uh, modularize all the different pieces that you need to go from transactional to uh, analytic data. Um, great idea, except for the fact that in execution, it, it re resulted in a lot of complexity, a lot of added complexity. So if we're looking at how this, how this you know, prediction performed over the past year, I'd say a metaphor here and I may be uh, guilty of overusing this, would be like having one leg in a bucket of boiling water and one leg in a bucket of ice. On average, uh, I guess it was middling. It was okay. Um, let me break this down into several areas. You know, some areas basically you know, showed more progress than others. I think in the area of flattening the analytics and transaction data stack, we saw pretty impressive progress. And this was progress that was already ongoing when we made this prediction last year. Um, you know, for instance, basically Oracle rethinking MySQL with HeatWay, which combined both an analytic and a transaction database, the first time that MySQL actually had been applied towards, you know, analytics. And Google doing similar things with, Al with Postgres in AlloyDB. Uh, I think what was really interesting this past year is seeing what Amazon's done. And what Amazon did, Amazon has, you know, now I've lost count, 15, 16 databases, you know, whatever. Um, it wasn't like all of a sudden that they were going back to database Pangea or anything like that, but they were now putting in more what I call seamless uh, connections, and they did it in a fairly ingenious way. They took advantage of the technology they used in Aurora, which is basically you know, looking at logs and doing and replicating change logs so that basically on their transaction database on Aurora, the performance would not be impacted. Instead, it would generate a change stream, which would automatically feed to uh, to Redshift, and they. Basically, the, the first announcement was with MySQL, which went GA. What's impressive is that Amazon, you know, AWS expanded this now to Postgres, and even more interestingly, to the NoSQL side with DynamoDB and, and, op and, and, and OpenSearch. And so that was actually very significant progress for basically a, you know, a cloud provider hyperscale that really has been known more for its complexity in the past to start to find a look to... Uh, put things together. Um, another area which I think was more sort of very strong progress is in database machine learning, fast becoming table stakes, fast becoming a check, you know, checkbox. Um, it's been implemented in different ways. Um, for instance, you know, you know, with with, with Redshift, um, basically it's a matter of calling in models that you've developed in SageMaker, whereas say for instance, with Oracle or or Google BigQuery ML, it's a matter of dealing with you know can machine learning models that are already you know in data in database. I think you know going forward, um, you know in in the future, I think there'll be a lot of very interesting progress in terms of how we can incorporate let's say foundation models you know in this as well. So I see very impressive progress there. Where essentially, it's not that you'll necessarily do all. AI within, you know, in database, but for those use cases where you would like to compress the stacks, um, I think there will be so, you know, expanding array of alternatives there. Um, where I'd say the progress has been more halting has been in the area of basically of, uh, of, of essentially data, you know, data transformation and streaming. Um, ELT has been a good, uh, has been, you know, has been an area of, of progress and which has been made possible in the cloud because of course storage is so cheap. So why not do the transformation in database and that eliminates a whole layer of the stack, that whole staging server. 
So that's been impressive. That's been going on. We expect, and that's become you know, basically a standard part of, of the modern data stack in the cloud. On the other hand, the continued popularity of tools like Fivetran for transformation and deep, or I should say Fivetran for, you know, for extraction load and DBT for transformation points to the fact that there's still a tool, there still is a stack of tools here and there's some, you know, needed integrations. And I'm looking forward to basically how they become more seamlessly integrated into the, into their host platforms. Um, finally, I would say where we've had the least progress, I think is with streaming um, and, and building and managing data pipelines. I do think I'm going to hold out an array of hope, which we'll go into in the predictions, because I think generative AI could make a contribution here in terms of simplifying and integrating data pipeline generation and data pipeline management. Great, good tease there. Thank you, Tony, good stuff. All right, moving right along, Carl Olson, you said that SQL is back and you're showing a sea of green in your evidence column. I, I gotta ask you, is SQL ever gone? Please explain your 2023 prediction and your proof points that led you to that direct hit evaluation. Well, okay, so to begin with about two years ago, the CEO of MongoDB declared that SQL is dead. Nobody's teaching it in school anymore. It's going away, nobody cares. And then of course, very short time after that, MongoDB came out with its own um, SQL query mechanism for, for documents So uh, on Atlas. So, so that immediately tells you that uh, there's, a, <clears throat> there's a reason for that pivot. In fact, uh, in addition to that, Couchbase, which who is their competitor in the J JSON document space, uh, is offering <clears throat> is offering uh, Capella Columnar, which is a column-based SQL analytics engine that uh, is, a, is a company's couch base on the Capella uh, win, uh, cloud platform. And Redis has been supporting SQL for the past couple of years. Databricks, which was once militantly Spark-based, in fact, if you had conversations with Databricks three or four years ago, they would have said, nobody cares about SQL anymore. Everybody's moving to Spark. Well, now they have their own uh, SQL uh, capability called Databricks SQL and a SQL statement API that they recently announced, so that you can um, so that you can invoke SQL uh, you can you can invoke SQL uh, in the form of of select uh, queries directly through this API. Certainly suggesting a, a shift in emphasis. The top most pop popular DBMS engines, according to DB Engines which is an online uh, rank ranking site, are Oracle, MySQL, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, and PostgreSQL, which are all, of course, based on SQL. Um, and Oracle has greatly expanded its, uh, its footprint in the SQL space, well beyond Oracle Database, making big investments in MySQL with HeatWave on OCI and also on, uh, on, um, uh, on uh, AWS, and um, also with the, uh, their newly announced uh, native OCI service for uh, open source uh, PostgreSQL. So, uh, in all those ways, they're, they're increasing their their footprint because they're and in their investment because they see that there's growing opportunity in the SQL space, and that in order to take advantage of that opportunity, they need to move beyond the boundaries of their flagship Oracle database. So, and we're seeing a number of other. I don't, you know, there's some time to go into all the other ways in which. SQL is, is is rising to the top of the of the tree. But uh, it was the case that people were saying, oh, that's old fashioned. We don't need SQL anymore. We we do these other things. And and actually when you look at it on the on the on the transaction processing side, um, there it, there was a distinctly negative attitude towards SQL amongst the application developers. Now we do know there's a strong preference among application developers for document products like MongoDB, and that's going to continue. And by saying SQL is back, I don't mean it's, it's washing away everything else. Uh, my personal belief that is, is that going forward, we're looking at a, what we might call a multi-model future, where databases are um, <clears throat> may support more than one format, both internally and externally, and more than one uh, method for accessing and organizing data. And uh, in, in fact, with the advent of, uh, of AI and generative AI in the environment where people want to see data put together in different forms, there'll be even stronger uh, push to uh, to have databases that support multiple different formats for data. But I believe that through all of that, SQL will remain the primary way 
of uh, doing a business data analysis because for this very simple reason, and the SQL is by far the most powerful uh, mechanism for doing um, uh, analysis of data without having to anticipate in advance in the structure of the database, what kinds of questions are going to be asked. Well, nice call, Carl. I mean, SQL remains the killer app of big data, as Amar Awadala said years ago. All right, David Menninger, you predicted that the definition of data is expanding using, you cited metric stores, uh, feature stores, model management, and data sharing as examples of what we could expect in 2023. And you show a mostly green level of accuracy for that prediction. Could you please elaborate? Sure. So, I mean, clearly the definition of data is expanding and, and maybe we should give ourselves all a red uh, X because we didn't capitalize on what was happening around Gen AI, but Gen AI has certainly expanded the definition of data. Um, but with specifically with respect to the, the four items I mentioned, um, it's Gen AI has also brought a greater focus on AI and the processes around AI. So we see much more interest in feature stores. We see much more interest in model management and trying to bring together you know, managing LLMs and, and other types of models as well. On the data sharing front, you know, we've got Databricks and Snowflake uh, battling over establishing standards on how data should be shared into some of Sanjeev's points earlier about data products. Uh, so I think, you know, those are all, I, I would give those all green ratings as, as you've displayed there. On the metric store front, there are a couple of vendors who are focused on metric stores specifically, uh, but I think it's gotten analytics and metrics uh, broadly speaking, have gotten less attention around the whole governance process. I'd, I'd like to see more of, of Sanjeev's uh, predictions and, and uh, desires for the market to expand the catalogs and to incorporate these things more fully. Uh, and then I think I would have would have given the metric score, store a green uh, rating as well. But uh, I don't think there's as much focus on that as there ought to be right now. So I'll keep my comments a little briefer and we can get to the 2024 predictions. Thank you for that, David. Appreciate it. You're keeping an eye on the clock. All right, last but not least uh, for the 2023 look back, we have Doug Henschen with the forecast last year that BI analytics reporting and dashboarding would be commoditized and embedding and automation would ascend. You've got some examples here and this looks like a direct hit. Uh, uh, please elaborate, Doug. Yeah, uh, I've been talking about uh, embedded BI and analytics uh, being on the rise for a few years, uh, written a lot of reports about it, and the trend continued in, in 2023. So it's green. Uh, we saw it's about embedding these insights at decision points, not forcing people to go off to separate reports and dashboards and then come back to their work and then make their decision. So to do that, we saw more SDKs, more granular APIs to to you know, let developers bring those insights into apps, more GitHub integration with CICD capabilities, uh, more low code, no code development options. We also saw more workflow from some of these BI and analytics vendors and use of event architecture to automate. So use those insights, not to trigger an alert to drive you off to a report or a dashboard, but to trigger an action in an application. And of course we saw the enterprise apps vendors like Oracle, SAP, Salesforce, Workday, all increasingly embedding insights at, at decision points within their enterprise applications. And then the late uh, late 2023 announcements I alluded to, you know, uh, to, in my book, we didn't really miss the Gen AI thing because uh, I think Microsoft was kind of premature in uh, in its in its Gen AI announcements. Very precious few actual Gen AI, cap uh, Gen AI capabilities for enterprise are generally available. Most everything is still private preview. Microsoft Copilot in Teams uh, and use of uh, Power BI, uh, accessing natural language query of, of Power BI exposed through Teams. Public preview finally, November, 2023. Uh, Tableau announced uh, Pulse. This is uh, more of a business user focused mm -hmm. insights embedded in things like Slack and email and later, probably this year, uh, more Salesforce apps. Amazon Q, which is really inspired by QuickSight Q, but now it's bringing that natural uh, language query into many places within the, the Amazon ecosystem. Also uh, a preview at this point. So um, lots coming that will further advance this, this trend in 2024. Great, some really good examples there, thank you. All right guys, appreciate you looking back on 2023, but let's get really to the heart of our call today 
and turn our attention to the 2024 predictions. We're going to keep the same order. The designated analyst will present his prediction, and then we'll have time for one or two other analysts to chime in on that forecast. Here's a table showing all of the predictions for 2024. 100% of them have AI included, but spanning new data platforms, governance, metadata, database, skills gaps, and more. So let's really get into it. Sanjeev, you first, please. You've got the rise of, of intelligent data platform. We've been talking about the next data platform beyond the so-called modern data platforms of Snowflake, Databricks, Google, AWS, Microsoft. You could probably include Oracle in there uh, in that mix as the database king. You've got that plus a call on governance and open source LLMs uh, going after proprietary foundation models. Lots to cover, so please take it from there and elaborate. So thank you for that. Uh, um, Dave, I have so many predictions. I want to keep it short. Uh, I published a, a, a blog recently with 10 uh, trends. Four of them are rising. All of them have to do with AI. The number one uh, prediction I have on my list is the intelligent data platform. What I'm saying here is that we've been talking, in fact, a lot of our predictions last year were on, uh, on a data stack. So modern data stack, or whatever you want to call it. So my prediction for this uh, year is that we are bringing AI into the mix. We are not taking data out to a separate data stack just to serve AI use cases. That would be too much of data movement uh, and uh, which brings all sorts of issues with it. But how do I bring AI into my existing data stack? And that's what I'm calling it an intelligent data platform. So essentially what we are doing here is that we've got our infrastructure layer, which is cross cloud or super cloud as, as you call it. And then we've got a unified storage layer. We've talked quite a bit about it and hope we may even talk more about, about a unified storage layer. Now we've separated out storage and uh, compute. Now we are, uh, we are also separating out our analytical engines. So we already did that. You know, we have a Spark layer, we could have Panda, we could have even DuckDB, uh, SQL, of course. In that layer of analytics, we are now bringing LLMs. These foundation models could be either open source or proprietary. So I could have OpenAI uh, or Anthropic Cloud, or I could have any other models from Hugging Face. So, so we are bringing the, the model catalog on top of our data stack. Also, we are adding vector search uh, along with that. The idea is that we expose this analytical layer through an API or an SDK layer. So then on top, we can still have data products. So the data products don't go away or the BI dashboards, which are actually data products. But now we are also adding more than just uh, data data artifacts. We could even have AI agents, which is going to be, a, a, in my opinion, a very big move in 2024. Uh, these AI agents will work on top of LLMs, but instead of just summarizing documents or translating it, they will kick off some sort of an uh, orchestration of a task. So AI agents, chatbots, so all that together is what I'm calling an intelligent data platform. Along with, with bringing data and AI together, we are also going to converge the governance of each. So we are now going to have AI governance, which will build upon data governance. In data governance, we had this ability to see what uh, what artifacts I have, technical metadata, business metadata, operation metadata. Now I should also be able to see what models are in use in my company. Are these models certified for use? What business cases are associated with those models? Because remember, uh, in fact, we just talked about multimodal. So so we got many uh, use cases. So this is the, the prediction that I'm making. And I see a lot of vendors are moving in this direction, a lot of hyperscalers, data breaks. I'm sure we'll see stuff coming out of Snowflake and then Oracle, Cloudera, Teradata. In my opinion, they'll all start converging into this integrated stack that I'm calling an intelligent data platform. 
I'll give you a quick data point on your comment about open source going after uh, proprietary foundation models. In the latest ETR survey of 1,700 IT decision makers, Llama 2 had approximately 17% more installation citations than Anthropic. And the other interesting data point was about 30% of those were on-prem. So topic for another day, but um, Doug Henshin and Dave Menninger, you got a quick comment on Sanjeev's uh, predictions. Uh, I'd start by saying um, very ambitious and visionary. Uh, and I think the marketplace is a, a long way from, from seeing the sort of so, sort of sophistication you're talking about. Maybe like the top one or 2% of companies that are sophisticated being able to do that sort of thing. Even vendors uh, are struggling with these things. We're starting to see some database vendors build their own models, uh, their own uh, generative models. Uh, uh, but we're really at, in the uh, stone knives and bearskin you know, rug stage of, of Gen AI. Um, and I, I even talked to a lot of CXOs and very few of them are aware of even, you know, the Calibra's Alations, Atlans, Microsoft Purviews, AWS Data Zones, uh, uh, Google Dataplex. Uh, uh, I think analysts shouldn't get too far ahead of uh, of, of where the market really is and the and the appetite for these things. We're 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 just starting to get to the early stages of previews. Uh, GA is still a long way off, and and actual usage. I think that OpenAI stat you had, uh, Dave, uh, indicated a lot of tire kicking and experimentation, but not a lot of real production use. So I was going to make a similar comment that I think, and but but I want to get to the heart of why I think the consolidation into intelligent platform is going to lag a little bit, and that has to do with the skill sets that are involved in the different activities, right? Clearly, we have to have the analytical processing in the platform, but the tooling around it, I believe, will continue to be separate. So maybe I'm nitpicking a little bit, but um, and the other point, I had similar data to you, Dave, that we see the open source models being used and adopted at similar levels to the commercial models. So in aggregate, so not, not picking one versus another, but in aggregate, the OSS models are being used as much as the uh, commercial models. Great, thanks guys. Okay, Tony Bear, up next. Um, we're showing your prediction that Gen AI will simplify database design, deployment, and operations. How so? Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, in, in essence, basically what I'm talking about here is actually um, kind of double clicking down what Sanjeev said. It's a less ambitious you know, view, but looking at not so much our enterprise is going to buy Gen AI tools. It's more that I see Gen AI, you know, generative AI and machine learning for that matter, further working their way in terms of how we operate databases. So it's not necessarily going to be an extra skew or anything like that. It's just going to be more a matter of like, some invisible automation that's going to happen underneath. Um, and so I'll just give some examples of what I kind of expect to see. And, and, and I think one reason why I'm I'm fairly bullish in the near term is that these are, you know, for the most part, this is fairly incremental improvements because we've been using, we've been working machine learning into the operation and design of databases for your life, for instance, like, you know, deciphering data structures. So I see this as being kind of a, you know, a, an incremental improvement. Um, for instance, for database designs, I think the biggest bang for the buck is going to be with essentially, you know, whatever deals with the content of the data. And this is where we basically can take advantage of some of, for instance, like, you know, the, the document entity extraction capabilities of foundation models. Again, we're not trying to ask, you know, enterprises to go full bore into adopting generative AI, but I could see some of this automation creeping inside, let's say, database design tools. So, for instance, we could imagine, I could imagine, for instance, you, you put into the requirements document. And basically, you know, some you know, and developer or you know, constituent, you know, basically the folks who are collaborating and putting in, you know, annotations and comments on the side, that you know, a a language, a large language model could essentially do some you know, entity extraction and based on requirements and and requests, could you know, could start to you know, suggest let's say some you know, some er, you know, to do some data modeling, some very rudimentary data modeling. I'm not talking about lights out here, but gives you a start. Here's a rough data model. Here's some rough entity relationship, you know, ER diagrams. You know, we'll, you know, start to generate a schema. Um, I could also see, and this one is, I think, relatively a no-brainer, uh, is this could be used for a synthetic data generation, which we use for a lot of testing. In other words, based on the characteristics of the actual data. In other words, have a language model look at that data and generate synthetic based on the characteristics of data that's already there. 
I think that's relatively speaking, you know, a, a no brainer. Um, further down the line, and I think this is gets more into Sanji's, you know, AI agents, and I don't necessarily expect this to be a done deal in 2024, but I could start to see the first steps towards basically taking the code generation capabilities, you know, you know, of generative AI to help start create some of those data transformation pipelines. Now we're seeing the first steps of this today with SQL code generation. There's, uh, you know, it's not a concept leap, it's more of a technology leap, which is gonna take further, to, you know, more time because designing the orchestrations and optimizing how we use compute for all this, that's gonna be, you know, those are gonna be details that are gonna take a while to work out. So I don't expect that to mature in 2024, but I expect to see some first steps there. Um, I also see in a related sense, I could see generative being applied towards the governance, you know, aspect of, of, uh, of database management. And I think a good example I'd like to point to is Atlan, which is a data catalog provider, um, and which is which is focused on there are many different types of data ad, you know, catalogs. This one focuses on, on data ops. They start with kind of a common natural language search function, which is kind of akin to some of the uh, you know, so the natural language or conversational query functions that you're starting to see in like, you know, in Q, um, you know, data, you know, or Databricks, you know, Lakehouse IQ, you know, so on and so forth. But this is being, you know, being applied towards like a, a search, you know, kind of go search of basically of metadata. It can auto discover, you know, meta database metadata. And this is also basically builds incrementally on what we've had with machine learning all these years, which can basically deduce things like table and column names, you know, schema specifications and data lineage. And then doc, and then this is the you know the, the the generative part, you know generate the documentation in plain English. Atlin is already starting to do that, so this is a type of thing I expect to see more of this year. Great, thank you, Tony. Carl, you've got a comment on Tony's prediction. Yeah, I just um, I think it's a great prediction, I, and I think that actually it dovetails pretty well with what Sanjeev was saying, because the the whole idea behind it is that we can take what is inherently very complex, which is enterprise data and you can we can render it into a form a, the database the data itself doesn't actually get simpler the, the physical database doesn't get simpler but our our interaction with the data gets simpler because it's being mediated by this generative ai capability which i think is what tony was talking about but it also makes it possible to do things like create the intelligent data platform because now we can you know building the intelligent data platform requires all of these little steps all these incredibly precise actions that you need to take to make sure that the data is, is synchronized and that it, that it makes sense together and all this kind of stuff. Human beings usually get, you know, they so they fall down on these things. The projects uh, start and stall and, and then get abandoned because it's too hard. But, uh, you know, uh, generative AI doesn't get tired. It doesn't get bored. It just does its job. <laughs> so. So I think that, uh, you know, to look at it that way, you know, Tony's idea of, of a simplification of the data environment, not necessarily the database, but the whole data environment and the way you build and maintain data dovetails nicely with what Sanjeev was saying. All right, Carl, let's stick with you um, and, and take a look at uh, your prediction that Gen AI and other developments are going to catalyze a rationalization of what I infer are data silos based on your prediction to enable combinatorial data use cases, which will ultimately create governance challenges. So I would say, you know, this may seem obvious to some people, but you're predicting, are you predicting that organizations are going to be able to succeed in 2024? Or will this governance challenge create insurmountable barriers to outcomes in this year? Please explain. Okay, so this prediction is kind of a cousin to Sanjeev's prediction in that he was talking about an intelligent data platform. I'm just saying right now, the, the data organization of most enterprises is a total mess, okay? It's not well coordinated. Data is created for individual applications and then people take data from the databases that were created for individual applications. They combine it together for specific analytic problems. They put it in the data warehouses and that kind of thing or they drop it in a data lake, <clears throat> but they're not really creating a coherent environment for the data overall. So it continues to be a mess. In order, when generative AI comes into the picture, it's going to start combining data in ways that it was never designed to be combined. You're either going to get irrational combinations because it, it's just going to make assumptions that are, are not valid, um, or it's going to expose things that we didn't expect to have exposed because it's picking data from different places that were pre previously 
uh, not connected at all. So we need to think about that. And we also we need to think particularly about how this impacts legacy data. So to answer your question, this is not a prediction that says this is all going to be done in 2024. No, that's, that's ridiculous. This could be a 10 year process of trying to rationalize data, but it has to be done. You'll never get the full value of generative AI data capture combination uh, presentation unless you also um, uh, unless you also uh, you know, deal with these issues and come up with decisions that say, for instance, we can't put this data together with this data, or this data can't be exposed because it, it's confidential. <clears throat> we didn't mark it confidential before because we didn't think it would ever be combined with something else that, that exposes that confidential nature, but now we have to. That's, that's, there's a lot of work there. So, um, I mean, Sanjeev was talking about a structure, which is the intelligent data platform. I'm talking about human effort, which is which is going to be messier. Even with generative AI helping, it's still going to be a big effort. Gotcha, thank you for that. Now, uh, Tony and Doug, I believe you've got comments on Carl's prediction. Okay, I'll, I'll dive in first, which is that, um, kind of like, I guess my prediction was kind of the bright side of this, but I think, you know, Carl basically very much points to the fact that this also gets us into deeper, more complex waters. And it's actually, a you know, it sort of echoes what happened with the modern data stack, which was supposed to bring all this stuff together, but added lots of, you know, complexity. So yes, as we start putting data together that we didn't, that wasn't necessarily put together before, uh, because it was, let's say, in different formats and different systems, it was in different contexts, um, that yes, it is going to start to, you know, we, we will start dealing with some Frankenstein, you know, you know type, you know, combinations. Um, so, I mean... And I think here, what's going to be really important is data lineage, you know, to kind of figure out like, you know, so we understand the provenance of all this data and understand what happens to it. And as Carl's saying, when we start getting into this recombinant stuff, we're getting into some deeper waters and it is going to take time for essentially our ability to cope with this is going to catch up. Great, thank you. you know, I, I would totally agree. I think the reality for enterprises is, is, is heterogeneity. Uh, we have seen efforts for this proverbial intelligent data platform. I think Microsoft Fabric is this idea that goes across their collaborative products, across their enterprise apps like Dynamics, across their uh, you know productivity apps. Uh, but most organizations, even mid-sized organizations, aren't that heterogeneity heterogeneous, uh, and organizations aren't necessarily interested in putting all their eggs in one basket. Uh, so. Uh, some of the chaos that Carl talked about is 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 spot on, it, and it's a tough challenge. It is a tough challenge, and also I would just point out in, in furtherance of what Doug was saying that the heterogeneity is important, and, and no, so no data platform that arises out of this can be uniform. It can be just one thing. It has to be has to be a, a more like a data environment, and maybe even a data environment that tolerates the idea that in different contexts, different sets of facts are true. In other words, you may have a different temporal context. You may say on last Tuesday, what was true? And then it'll tell you what was true last Tuesday, which is different from today. So, um, you know, all of that needs to be uh, part of the system. Giving new meaning to alternative facts. Okay, up next, Dave Menninger uh, with the prediction that despite all the hype around Gen AI, it won't replace traditional AI in the most demanding use cases. And, and you're predicting also a continued AI skills gap. Dave, again, this feels like a lock, but add some color and some data points that increase the degree of difficulty for us, please. Well, so the reason I think it's important to discuss this is that generative AI is sucking all the air out of the room. And so I think people need to be aware that yes, there's a lot of attention. It's doing a lot of great things. It's making various uh, software products easier to use. It's easier to code software products. But in the most demanding use cases, it really isn't there. It's, that's not what it's designed to do, at least not yet. Um, so for instance, we have some, some research that shows that in areas like document summarization or in uh, natural language assistance, clearly generative AI is, is more likely to be valuable there. It's going to have a greater impact. In our research, uh, one and a half times as likely to have a greater impact there. However, when you go to the other end of the spectrum, and this particular set of research was around banking, if you look at things like credit risk, fraud detection, algorithmic trading, even customer acquisition, predictive AI models, traditional AI, was twice as likely to have an impact over the next two years than generative AI. So 
so there are these areas where it's important to recognize we need more advanced skills and capabilities to develop those types of models. Data scientists have to understand a lot of things. They have to understand the biases in the data. They have to understand the training processes. They have to worry about overfitting and poor sampling. Um, and you also have to understand that models are never 100% accurate. You need to evaluate the impact of false positives and false negatives. So while AI, generative AI is, is making tooling better, including you know the use the the generative AI process to create models. Uh, I'm not trusting my personalized medical care to anything that wasn't developed by a Stanford uh, trained you know biomedical PhD, right? I want the real knowledge in there, and I want people developing those models that have the skills. And our research shows the skills don't exist today. One quarter of organizations report they have the, they have the skills they need to develop AI models, and two thirds report that they can't. Uh, get those skills, and they're the most difficult skills for them to find and retain in the market. So I want to make people aware, don't put all your eggs in the generative AI basket. It's absolutely valuable, but don't put all your eggs in one basket. David, I love how you always bring the data to back up your opinions. And Sanjeev and, and Carl, do you have anything to add here? So I, since I've, I've taken on this role of being an insufferable optimist, so I, I may say... <laughs> We, or maybe just insufferable. Uh, I, all I, I, what I want to say is that in 1994, if somebody had told me that don't put all your eggs in one basket called World Wide Web because it's just, just toy. All it does is just show static data. I would have never imagined that you know 10 years later my entire tax code would be online. I would never have to go to a travel agent. I would. I could buy stuff. So I agree with Dave that, you know, it's early in its journey, uh, Gen AI, but I have faith that in a few years, and this is going to be the new norm. If I look at the history before uh, World Wide Web took over, we already had markup languages on Unix, I used to use HTML, but HTML made things very easy. TCP IP had been in existence for 25, 30 years, and then HTTP came and it became pervasive. So I feel Gen AI is at that early stage of World Wide Web in 1994, and another 10 years, it could be a different story. Betting big. Carl, you had a comment? Yeah, I just, um, I wanted to reinforce what Dave said and um, offer this observation that if, if you recall a movie called The Right Stuff, you'll remember that um, in that movie, uh, the scientists believed that the astronaut, would, astronaut or astronauts would just be passengers and that the computer equipment would, would run, the, run the whole thing. And if they had gotten their way, John Glenn might not have survived because he had to go manual in order to adjust the angle of, of entry for his capsule uh, because of something else that went wrong. And so, uh, and he, of course, and of course, in Apollo 13, because there were three highly trained pilots, they were able to save their own lives by making adjustments that that were involving a little bit more than just calculations. It involved just sort of see of the pants, rough estimates, and looking and based on the knowledge, doing the right thing. So um, my point is this. Uh, a generative AI does indeed do a lot of work for us that we wouldn't need to do it. It relieves uh, the responsibility from non-technical people so that they can, they can do their jobs without having to learn a lot of stuff. But at the same time, it, I believe, along with Dave, that it will ultimately open up more opportunity for highly trained individuals to guide it in the right directions, to help set up the, the environments so that everything works right and to avoid problems. I'm not even talking about hallucinations, which I think are relatively easy to avoid, but more uh, more problematic things that involve uh, misinterpretation and, and improper combinations of data and that kind of thing. So, so I totally agree that this is actually an opportunity for more, not less skills development. Yeah, nice throwback references, Carl, thank you. All right, we just got about five minutes left. The last prediction comes from Doug Henshin, who's predicting that Gen AI will have a material impact on how organizations approach BI and predictive analytics. Doug, this is a prediction with big implications for data analysts, data pros working in the pipeline, Tableau jocks, and end business users, very exciting. Are you saying we'll see this transformation before the end of the year? No, no, I'm saying this is continuing the trend I talked about in 2023, increasing use of embedding, increasing use of 
of insights being exposed where people are doing their work. Uh, you know, the, the most adopted and most used feature in these, the augmented analytics trend that it started, you know, five, eight years ago was natural language query. And Gen AI in 2024, you know, 2023 was all about announcements. Late 2023, we started to see public previews. 2024, we're going to start to see GAs. And the most material impact on BI analytics is going to be putting natural language query on steroids, more accuracy, uh, more verbose, more interpretive, uh, and, and you know, Gen AI will help you as the examples I gave, Microsoft Copilot, uh, Tableau, uh, Einstein Copilot, um, you know, um, uh, AWS, Amazon Q. We're gonna start to have this query anywhere you need it in apps, in places other than just a, a BI platform. I think the caution, is that it's still going to be important, uh, a, a really important role for analysts, and that's going to be curating the data, curating the question, curating the prompts. You know, mainstream business users don't necessarily know what to ask. So when you see natural language query interfaces, often there are questions sort of there, prompts uh, to get them started. Uh, and they're going to be curating business metrics. They're going to be um, Maybe we won't, we'll have Gen AI building the dashboards and reports for those that are still needed as sort of a system of record. Um, but I think the, the analyst class are going to be focused more on uh, deciding the key metrics that matter, determining whether is this good or bad for business and guiding users uh, in their natural language query interactions on, on decisions they uh, need to make. So. Uh, business users will need those prompts, will need guidance as they start to use Gen AI instead of toggling between dashboards and reports and their transactional interfaces. You have more of a change in role versus an elimination of that role. Dave Menninger, and I know you you got you to gotta run, and, and Tony, you've got some quick comments here, and then we'll wrap. Yeah, I'll make a quick comment. Thank goodness. <laughs> in, in three quarters of organizations, less than half of the workforce has access to analytics. This is the solution for solving that problem. Uh, prior to Gen AI, we saw that about a quarter of organizations were using natural language processing. 80% um, were using dashboards and reports. We need to see the inverse of that so that more of the organization can access analytics. All right, Tony, give you the final quick, word here. Yeah, a quick point, which is that I think the uh, thing what Doug said here, which is that where the importance is going to be is curating data, questions, and prompts. It's knowing how to ask the right questions of the data. Because, the, because basically technology will be there to get it. So I think what Doug is saying right there, it's all going to come down to people know, knowing how to ask the right questions. Can, Guys, can, I, just, can I just add one quick thing on that? Because this is, see, I, I want to just continue this, this dialogue I had earlier about like how technology advances. So to me, prompt engineering today is highly complex and it just keeps changing. But it, to me, this reminds again back to the time when internet search first came out. Remember we had to put double quotes and put some hints here and there. Now we don't even think about it. So same thing, we are at this early stages of prompt engineering. Yeah, no doubt. Guys, I'm sorry we got to go, but I want to share my personal gratitude. It's, it's amazing to me, this has been our third year through. It kind of started back at AWS reInvent in, in 2021. And, Looking forward to more collaboration in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. All right, also happy want to thank Alex Meyerson. Yes, happy new year. Who's on production and manages the podcast. Ken Schiffman as well. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our editor in chief at siliconangle.com. Remember all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. I, I don't know if you know this. I'm really proud to say we hit almost 650,000 downloads of Breaking Analysis this past year, wow. Um, all you got to do is search Breaking Analysis po Podcast. I publish each week on siliconangle.com and thecuberesearch.com, and you can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Comment on our LinkedIn post and check out etr.ai. They get great survey data, constantly updating the data set. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.